My name is Chris Burkhardt, and today I'm here to talk about documentary filmmaking. And as a Sony artisan who's been with the brand for about 10 years, I can honestly say that shooting smaller, more discreet um, cameras has really changed, for me at least, the way that I've been able to, to operate and function and run in these in these really unique situations where you're in intimate scenarios with people, when you're on expeditions. I mean, that, that's really been the game changer for me, like the biggest tool. Um, what I really wanna dive into today um, is just kind of a, sadly not a conversation since this is digital, but sort of a loose conversation around the idea of, of what do you look for? What are you, what are you hoping to gain when you're, when you're shooting um, some sort of a documentary? And over the years, I've been lucky enough to do um, documentary films like Under Arctic Sky. Dude, this is it, this is it right here. If they get a wave. Russia, um, Unner, our newest film that's coming out right now, um, a whole bunch of other smaller, bigger projects for Sony and, and, and kind of everything in between. And really, um, the dream scenario here is, for me is always to figure out the goal in mind. What, what is the main singular takeaway that you're hoping that the viewer watches, right? In the beginning of my career, when I was working on surf films, um, we were going to places like Kamchatka. We were going to places like um, remote Alaska, the Aleutian Islands, where we worked on the Cradle of Storms film. Um, we were going to the Faroes. Um, we made a film from there. Russia, we made a film from there. Um, the, the goal was always really singular. It was to go to these places, tell a story about the, the search, the hunt, the exploration for new and interesting surf, right? Now, that's great, and I'm telling you this because in the, in the early days, in the beginning, it was really a lot about kind of letting the landscape, letting sort of this location sort of speak for you. Um, I didn't pay enough attention to the concept that, you know, although these places are beautiful and stunning, and yeah, the waves are great, it's really the people. It's really the, um, the characters that you need people to fall in love with. So, as I've taken this journey as a, as a filmmaker and as a photographer, I've, I've tried to really realize and learn one of the most important lessons. And that's really what I'm hoping to kind of um, get through to you today is a couple of these really key things that I've learned along the way. And if you keep these key things in the forefront of your thoughts, then you will never fail, right? And one of the biggest things is that character development is everything. And when I say that, what I mean is that you not only need to have a strong character or have a strong sort of guide through your film, but you need people to care about them. And in order for people to care about them, one of the most important things you can do is you can build up that character. This doesn't mean that you need to make them perfect. This doesn't mean you need to make them um, in some way infallible or without mistake. In fact, those types of human traits, looking for those human traits, the way in which we relate to those people is what makes them really win our hearts. And for me, starting to learn and understand the importance of that when making films has changed everything. I mean, that is truly the most significant thing that I have, I have ever found to be a guiding light within documentary filmmaking. Now let's stop there for a second and back up. What is documentary filmmaking, right? Typically you think a documentary is kind of like, Oh, okay, well, I'm gonna be going around and filming somebody in real life, in real time, you know, running around with a camera and you're like in their face, you're getting every little moment. Well, yes, that's a documentary, but there's also a documentary in the sense that you might be going back and retelling a story that happened, right? Typically, documentary filmmaking is rooted in real life experiences, right? It's not like a fictional story that was created like a, like a motion picture film, right? So a documentary film, will oftentimes, you know, it's a very loose term nowadays, but it might have pieces of the truth that have been then kind of helped to be created. That's more of the Hollywood version. Um, a lot of times it's taking sort of historical or anecdotal footage or articles or letters or photographs and you're tying this in. Ultimately, you're telling a real story, right? And one of the things that I've learned, because um, in the beginning of my career, it was all about going there, you're shooting on the trip and whatever you walk away with, whatever you come home with, that's all you have. Okay, that's it, you have nothing more, right? You shot the trip, you shot every little waking moment you could, um, but the reality is you can't go back and recreate any of this stuff. And, and, and I think what I realized over the years 
is that yes, that's important, but sometimes in order to build up and explore some of these scenes deeper, you might need to go back through there. And one of my very first experiences in making um, a successful documentary film was Under an Arctic Sky. It's a film that is about a group of surfers who goes to Iceland and endures the biggest storm in 25 years. And after that, they kind of form this, um, I guess, unbreakable bond that forces them into the situation where they're going out and they're surfing at this remote beach under the Northern Lights. We have that experience that like, that was something that happened and we all witnessed it. Now, that's the storyline. Now, to do that trip and to do that story, we made two trips. We went there, we had the experience as I laid it out to you, the storm, the, the boat, the, the Northern Lights, the cabin, the whole thing, but we walked away from that trip with about 10 minutes of footage. Now, why? Because we didn't go there with the intent of making a documentary film. We went there with there the intent of making a fun little surf film for the client who was Surfer Magazine. But we walked away with this incredible story and I knew in my heart of hearts in that moment that I needed to do something greater to help tell this story. That I needed to expand and really branch out further to help tell this story and this narrative. So what did I do? Well, I went out, I got some funding and I went back. And what we did when we went back was we, we recreated as much as we could to kind of build up more of that footage. We wanted this to be in the 40 minute length scenario. So we shot time lapses, we shot landscapes, we shot a lot of the B-roll to fill in some of these, thing, these scenes. And then we also shot interviews and we recreated some stuff of what we could. Re we recreated some storm scenes because we didn't shoot enough in that moment. We shot maybe 10, 15 seconds total when it actually happened. Um, so we, we tried to go out there and without changing the story or without altering the story, we tried to create more content that we could to really build up this thing. Now, through that experience, I really learned something critical and I, and I hope that you can apply this to your documentary filmmaking techniques, uh, protocols, and or, or hopes and goals there. And that being said, it was so important especially when we got into the edit bay. When we sat there in the edit bay and we're like, okay, here's all the footage we have. The first trip, the second trip, we realized in that moment, wow, there's a lot of characters here. There's a lot of people involved in this project. How do we tell each of their stories? And that's really what became the greatest challenge, so to say, is like, how are you going to make people care about each one of these people? Well, that's a good question. I want to relate this to a story that maybe you have heard. It's about a boy in a shire with a ring and his job is to go and put the ring into the fire to save the whole world, right? The Lord of the Rings film, right? Well, this is one of the greatest classic examples of, of filmmaking and how sort of the, the story, the antagonist protagonist theory comes to life. What I mean is that there is a singular main character, Frodo. But what you notice is that all the other characters are equally as important, but their role, their job is really to support the main character. So in this film, On an Arctic Sky, I was thinking a lot about that scenario. It's not important necessarily for there to be um, a bunch of main characters with a bunch of objectives. Again, this is getting back to that first thing I said, what's the thesis? What's the goal? What's the conversation here? Well, what we realized in Under Arctic Sky was what we needed to lay out the characters, not based upon their accolades or how great they are at something. What did they have on the line? What did they put out there? And we kind of realized that Justin Quintal, who was one of the surfers, he was the person who had the most riding on this. He was the person who later on, he ended up getting the cover of Surfer Magazine. He ended up getting sponsored by his first sponsor. It changed his life. And so how do we parlay this experience to being really about him? It's from his perspective. Now, this is one of the, the most beautiful things about documentary filmmaking, is if you're gonna go out there and make a documentary about Hitler um, and World War II and the Nazis, well, the perspective might not be interesting to tell it from Hitler's perspective. It might be interesting to tell it from a family member's or somebody else. The goal here, what I'm saying, is that you take these subjects who seem kind of like the obvious main character, and then you're gonna want to kind of tell a different side to that story. So what the goal was with our film was I came in as sort of another sub-character and I was hoping to narrate this experience kind of through my lens, but it's about Justin Quintal. And really, and it's about his 
kind of rise to, I guess, surf stardom, you, you could call it, right? All the other characters. I basically just took two red eyes to get here. It was pretty cold coming from Hawaii to here, so. Justin was in Florida, and I was in New Jersey, and uh, there's a blizzard. Just as important, just as interesting, but their role was not shared as much. Their, their kind of trials were not shared as much as this one person's. I don't know, this is the fourth night we've been out here trying to get something a little frustrating. Now, that can be a daunting task because ultimately how do you kind of get to the fact that you're going to ultimately you know, hone in on this one person? Well, it takes some digging, right? And I think that's what we had to do in the edit bay is we had to go back, look through the footage, organize the footage. Okay, here's everything we have on each character. We listed out like a long list of sticky notes. What's each person's, um, what's each person's sort of commitment? What's each person, what is each person giving up to be here? And then we kind of built this story arc, right? And this is really the most important thing I've found is if you're making a film that's in the two to three minute range, um, or five minute range, short, real short, short, um, it's not really important to have sort of the hero's journey, so to say, or the struggle or the trial. But if you are making a film that's 20 minutes in length, 30 minutes in length, 40 minutes in length, you really do have to have a struggle. You really do have to have a trial. Why? Because it's not interesting otherwise. Because people want to see us overcome something. People want to see, even if you're shooting a nature documentary, you want to see the seal, you know, escaping the shark or whatever that is. It's important to understand that this idea of heroics, whatever the, whatever the case, somebody overcoming something, somebody achieving something, somebody learning something new, um, this is really the backbone of what makes a good documentary interesting. Um, and obviously, we see these examples over and over again in history, which is what makes history such a great subject for documentaries. Now, I think one of the key components when you're actually diving into the filmmaking process is thinking about how do you let these moments really ring true. And I remember very, very specifically having a conversation with uh, Jimmy Chin, actually, and he, he mentioned something to me that, that really always stuck with me. He said, he's like, you know, if you have the opportunity for the viewer to just sit with the silence, don't try and, you know, overcrowd a scene with a ton of music or a ton of audio or a ton of narration. If there's a scene that feels heavy, that feels um, kind of daunting, that, that feels whatever, that feels like there might be some emotion there, you let that scene just play out and you allow the viewer to really be there, to really sit with it. Why? because that's where the viewer forms that connection. That's where the viewer forms that opinion. That's where the viewer feels in some way like they can relate. And I think that's a key and really critical part of, of what it takes and what it means to make a successful documentary film. Because you're hoping that you're not adding all these theatrics and adding all these moments that, that would take away from the true, raw, real emotion. Now, I think one of the, the key components here is that if you're out there, everybody who might be watching this and you're thinking, I've got a documentary idea in mind. Awesome. Let's talk about that. Let's break that down. Um, what does that look like? Well, again, the best way that I can describe it and is through my own experience. So um, I'm going to take you through a newer project that, that is something that I got funded, um, filmed, and now it's touring and festivals. And by the time you watch this, uh, it might even actually be out for public viewing purposes. It's a film called Unner. Now, I've, I've taken this kind of um, you know, rise from making surf films to making more in-depth surf films to doing a lot of commercial work um, to working on a lot of friends projects, coming on as a director, co-director, producer, uh, and, and what have you, right? I've worn a lot of different hats over the years and I've been lucky enough to make um, a whole number of projects over the last 10 years. This project for me, this newest one is my most personal, intimate, favorite project I've ever worked on. Why? Because what happens is through the process of making films, you, you start to realize something really important. And this specifically boils down to the documentary idea, is that you are always going to be more invested in a film that you feel emotionally connected to. If you have no emotional connection to that film, to that project, the chances of you being willing to stay up late, 
wake up in the middle of the night, go shoot those northern lights when it's freezing cold, um, stay for that interview forever are going to be slim to none. Why? Because if somebody's coming to you saying, hey, there's a project I really care about and I want you to really care about it, it's really hard to find that same emotion, to find that same connection to it. Now, that being said, what does that mean? Well, ultimately, you need to be kind of letting these stories be born out of your own experience, right? What are you passionate about? Do you play football? Do you play sports? Are you all about um, advocating for social justice movements? What is, what is your passion burning inside you and what stories do you want to tell? Find that story. Pull upon that thread and that's where you'll find the stories most meaningful. That's where you'll find the stories that you won't give up on. Because let me tell you one thing, making a documentary of any sort requires some element of never giving up. My latest film is called Unner. Growing up, I spent every free moment outdoors. And it's the story of a good friend of mine, Ellie Thor, and his daughter, um, who basically he's been raising um, as a single parent and struggling with the trials and tribulations of pursuing what you love and living a life that's close to nature with basically the pressures of society. And early in Ellie's life, he endured a massive um, near-death experience that, that almost killed him. And um, his perspective has changed incredibly from that. And so that's the premise of the story. That's the elevator pitch, right? Now, why is this story important? Well, I was able to go and make a story on my friend, somebody I care about. It's a story that I relate to because I am a parent and I, I struggle with these same thoughts. It was a story about um, his, his love for photography and surfing, things that I care about. And he has this beautiful daughter that he's basically giving an incredible life to and she has a passion for being in the water and surfing too. So all of these things I relate to and resonate with me. So again, that's kind of, I guess, a good recipe, a good beginning for how you can start to Think about a documentary film and how it might be able to relate to you. Now, Ellie and this film, when we went into it, our goal was everything is hearsay. This is like colloquial, it's a story, right? Somebody's telling you about their experience and you're trying to bring it to life. So how did we do that? Well, first case scenario usually is always to do an interview. Even if it's a close friend of yours, even if you know the story, get that interview recorded, right? This is the actual steps we took before we film, before anything. We did an interview. I hired a good friend of mine, Matt McDonald, a writer, to interview Ellie. And what he did is he interviewed him, asked him about his whole story, about his life, everything. And he extracted these little tidbits so that we could put on this whiteboard, here's all the themes, here's the struggles, here's what he loves, here, you know, this and that. And then we, we started to extract the story that way. And then we started to write out a mood board like, okay, which scenes would we need to shoot? Well, we need to shoot the kayak scene and the waterfall scene and the scene um, kind of of him drowning or where it happened. Um, we need to show um, Ellie living in a tiny A-frame cabin and, and the, the, the trials that come with that, the space restrictions. We need to show kind of um, his relationship with his daughter and, and sort of being a single parent and the struggles there and also the joy they share together. So this was the whole package, right? How that was going to come together, we had no idea. But that's okay because we already broke this down and we knew that we'd have enough parts to support the whole. And, and again, this is a challenging situation because we weren't going out and making a documentary about a, uh, you know, a cliff jumper jumping the biggest cliff in the world and you're shooting all like the stressful moments in between. It's more like reality TV. This is like a recreation of something that happened. And so you're trying to do that with as much tact and as much care and concern as possible. And so this is really where, for me, this is where the creativity comes in. Because, again, there's these kind of two types of documentary filmmaking. One being when you're going out and you're shooting everything in the moment as it's happening and you're unloading this piece by piece and you're basically just kind of trying to document a person or a subject or a team or a band or whatever in every moment. Or you're taking something that's been told to you, a story, and you're formulating that visually, right? Now that can be a little more challenging. And this is why you extract the story, you build out the scenes beforehand, because you're gonna go there, right? At that point, obviously we got funding. We sourced funding from Sony and Billabong to help underwrite the trip. That could be a whole nother class, a whole nother lesson. I'm sorry that I'm not sharing that today, but, um, but that was an important part of it. I put together a deck that laid out the storyline, how it would, um, 
how it would appeal to those brands, what the ROI was gonna be, what the outreach was gonna be, and what they could expect from it. So with bringing these brands on board, the point there really is to make sure they understand, and explore, and, and know full well the return on investment, the ROI, right? What they're gonna get out of it and what you can hope to kind of provide for them. Now, the beauty here is that with this project, again, the goal was simple. It was to go there, it was to kind of create enough assets to help tell the story visually and hopefully beautifully so that whoever watches it feels in some way like they're there. Now, let's stop right there and think about something. Ellie almost died in a kayak accident. So does that mean that we're gonna go recreate that kayak accident? No. Are we gonna try and do something cheesy and show somebody drowning? No. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take creative liberties and we're gonna shoot a scene that feels kind of esoteric and moody and and has a lot of jump cuts with water and feelings or, or visions that you might see firsthand if you were underwater, if you were suffocating, if you were scared for your life behind a waterfall. That's just something that takes time and effort and energy and it takes going out and recreating some of these moments in the most natural um, way you can. We, we jumped behind these waterfalls, we showed rushing water, we shot down as water swirled through rivers, we shot these longer emotional shots, we, 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 we cut it up really fast and made your heart beat. So again, we never had to show a singular moment of Ellie actually being under the water with a kayak or something like that. We had to try and recreate this in the most honest and real way possible by showing you hopefully scenes that related to the emotion of it, right? Now, um, this project uh, came out really well. Uh, there's actually an amazing BTS cut that you'll be able to see soon. Um, and and it, really, um, it really helps to illustrate the vision of kind of what we were going for. I would say that with this project, um, one of the, the dreams and scenarios here with a lot of documentaries is why, why do you do them, right? This is kind of the, the backbone here. You're, you're not usually doing them to make money. I mean, unless you are at the upper echelons of your career, but for me, I'm not doing it to make money. And I guess this is a subject I should have addressed in the beginning, but the reality is everything you do, whether it's working on a book, working on a film, working on whatever, if this is a personal project or if this is something you're doing for um, sort of personal value, it's best to work backwards. And what I mean by that is identify and figure out what your goals are going into it. With all the films that I've done, they've been a supplement piece or, or, a, or a part of a project that supports the greater parts of the whole, right? So with this film, uh, this documentary film, Unner, that we made, uh, the goal here was to basically create something that could go to festivals and that could be spread around the world, get a lot of views, right? which hopefully, again, can be meaningful. It can fulfill, I think, a lot of people watching it. It can spread a lot of joy, but also, from a business perspective, it can then put my name in the ringer for bigger and greater projects by being the director on this piece and by being um, one of the DPs in this piece as well as a producer, etc. It allows me to kind of um, chick one more notch in my chain so that I have the ability to kind of put my hat forward for bigger, longer form projects, right? Or when I go to a brand personally and I say, hey, I've got this idea, they can look back at my track record and like, okay, well, the last two films you did, last three films you did, last were on iTunes and Netflix and yada, like they know that there's a lot of success there. So that's kind of one of the key, com key components here. Um, I want to talk a bit with you guys and I wish that we were in person because I love the idea of, of asking questions and having this integration here. Um, I wanna talk a bit uh, about the experience of kind of like what it's like to shoot on these projects, right? Um, how do you kind of go about that? Well, let me just say here, I, I mentioned this in the beginning, but when it comes to documentary filmmaking, man, if you even just have your phone, right? This is a great tool to use. I mean, the, the reality is you don't need some massive, huge, billion dollar camera system. A lot of what I've shot my films on have been tiny, small Sony Alpha mirrorless cameras, like what I'm shooting this on now, right? Um, the goal there is that the less space you create between you and your subject, the more intimate it's gonna be. And what I mean by that is that, I mean that in the, the truest, most realist of ways. There is going to be actual closer distance. So if you're trying to get these intimate moments and you're trying to get moments that don't throw people off, that don't throw people out of their, their world, I mean, keep in mind, I'm talking about whatever you're shooting. If you're shooting behind the scenes documentary of Metallica's epic 2020 tour, 
the, the bigger camera gear, the more flashes and lights and strobes and this and that, the less real and raw it's gonna feel. And the, the point of a good documentary should be a rawness, a textural quality that feels like, wow, I'm there. And that can be achieved a lot of times by a small camera. Whether that's a phone, whether that's a DSLR, whether it's a tiny RX100 or whatever, um, don't, un, don't ever try to tell yourself that the, the quality of the camera is what dictates a great project or a great narrative or, or a great creative piece in general. So often it's really more about your access as a filmmaker and your access as a filmmaker is dependent usually upon two things. One of them, the size of your crew, the size of your camera. Second thing being how well you know that person. Now, um, let's address both those. So documentary film crews are kind of known as these small, sleek, uh, you know, get in, get out. Everybody wears a lot of hats. When we went to shoot a lot of these films, it was usually myself and two other filmmakers, or two, two DPs, a drone pilot, and then maybe a DP I'm directing, but I'm also picking up a camera, I'm also shooting time lapses, I'm also flying drone. You're wearing a lot of hats because you don't wanna have a crew of 10 people, why? It's hard to mobilize, it's hard to move around, it's hard to grab stuff, you're, you're, you're toting around all this luggage and crap. And what happens is when those great moments happen, it's nearly impossible to pull out a camera and actually shoot it. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's think about this. You are trying to shoot this incredibly intimate experience of somebody doing something in a documentary film and that one tiny moment where you know, you're doing a camera swap or a lens swap or your memory card runs out, um, that moment's happening and you're not there, that's a bummer. Right, And so I think that that kind of coincides with the intimacy that you have with your subject. And the intimacy you have with your subject comes back to that original idea of how close are you? How, how much did you pull on that thread? Are you telling a story about somebody you know? Something about a story about something you are connected to? Are you telling a story about somebody that's alive? Right. All those things are going to be greatly increased by your relationship with that subject. It really dawned on me at a certain point, you know, within the, the last, you know, almost 10 years that I've known him that, like, this is a story I had to tell. This is one that was so near and dear to me, was so precious to me, was so important that, like, if I didn't do it, I didn't think anybody else could. And so I, I, I called upon some of my closest friends, Ben Weil and Jeff Taylor, and, and an amazing crew of people to help on this. And I said, you know, I think it's time. I think we have to go for it. This is why oftentimes the greatest documentaries are shot by people who are in some way connected or in some way feel close to that subject or that subject matter. And that's really where I want your minds to be. I want you to think about that concept of like, what are the stories I want to tell? Okay, write that list. And then what are the stories I want to tell that I, I know well, or I've put the time into, or I know this person, right? And that's really a great place to start. I mean, to be honest, this is one of the, the most heroic things. And when you are shooting these things, one of the, the kind of tips and tricks that I would say when it comes to a great documentary is there are a lot of ways to get around the idea of, oh man, I don't have that footage. Oh crap, we, I missed that moment. You can use animation, um, actual animation, right? That's a cool way of storytelling. There are no rules, no rules in documentary filmmaking. You do what you want. You can do anything you want. That's the beauty of it, right? Use animation. I love to use photo manipulation or photo animation. In a lot of my films, you'll see images come to life by extraction and detail that really is we go to a 3D animator and they work on that. Um, there are great other forms of kind of tools we've used. We've recorded phone calls that we've recreated with me and like a, a captain of a, of a boat to kind of make it feel like this was uh, something that happened months, months prior, right? Um, so these are, these are interesting tactics and tips and tricks but one of the greatest things I would say is that this is just something that really takes time to understand, is that if you're shooting this subject and you're shooting this person, right, and they're having this experience, it's oftentimes that old adage where, you know, you're looking at the sunset and it's beautiful and it's warm and it's tonally gorgeous and everything, but that's not the moment. The moment is when you turn the camera around and you shoot your subject and it's all about their emotion and their face and the glow that's on them and making sure not to forget those moments because those are the ones we've all seen 
the sunset. We all know how beautiful that looks, but the expression of on someone's face, like the emotion they're going to, that's what you connect with. And that's really, really what you're looking for when it comes to making a documentary film. So as I've, as I've gone through this workshop, you guys, I've really tried to touch on, as you can tell, kind of like the overarching themes and qualities of what it's like to work on a documentary film. I mean, I could spend days, weeks, months talking to you about audio, camera systems, you know, uh, like what type of frame rate do you want to shoot in, yada, yada, yada. I don't want to weigh you down with that. Why? Because in the end, it's not important. What's important is being passionate about a project and being willing to tell the story and then learning and figuring out the style in which you want to do it. And now what I want you to think about as I kind of wrap up here is how do you push go on this project? How do you, how do you like start, right? Well, again, you think about those concepts that are important to you, that are significant to you. What is that story you've always wanted to tell? Do you have an in with that person, with that place? Um, is this a historical story where you're going to have to talk to, you know, are you going to make a film about Ansel Adams, right? Let's use this for an example. Well, he's passed on, but there's a lot of footage. I'd start looking into who owns the rights to that footage. Who can I use to collect that? Who, who do, do I have to reach out to the family to get permission? Do I have to reach out to the trust? Who do I have to talk to to get access to that stuff? And then what's the story that's been, that's not been told that I want to tell? What's the angle? Is it the story of Ansel Adams from... Um, one of his relatives? Is it the story of Ansel Adams from the perspective of Yosemite? What's the way to make it interesting? Great, great documentary that I think anybody here could appreciate is fellow Sony artisan Ben Moon's Denali. It's about a story of him and his dog and the relationship they had when he had cancer and then his dog got cancer. It's only eight minutes. It'll make you cry, I promise. It's amazing. And yeah, in the truest sense, it actually is a documentary. It's obviously a recreation of a lot of moments and scenes, but yes, this is it. Now, with that project, what made it so interesting, again, perspective, it's from the dog's perspective. How cool is that, right? Giving us this story of connection and, and opportunity to, to really take the creativity to the umpteenth level from the dog's perspective. Why is that cool? Well. Let's think about this. If the story is coming from me, from my words, from my lips, I can only say so much. I can only share so much. But if a story is coming from a baby, a dog, an inan inanimate object, a place, you can say whatever you want. You can use you know, songs and lyrics and rhymes and, and words that don't even make sense. It gives you the ultimate freedom. So think about the story. Think about the perspective of the story. Who's it being told from? And then once you do that, I mean, ultimately, it's really start about extracting those details, getting those details down. What do you know? What do you not know? Where do you shoot this? Where does it take place? Um, and then you think about funding, okay? You have to put in the time before you think about the funding. You have to put in the time to create sort of this boilerplate storyline and how you want to get it out there. And in that case, you'd create a deck or you'd create some sort of a PDF or a Adobe Spark or an InDesign document and you'd share it with maybe some brands who might want to get on board with it or if you're making a documentary for a Netflix, for an Amazon, you want to share that with a network. Hey, got this great documentary piece. It's about a cult that lived in Oregon. <laughs> I don't know. And then you would pitch them on that, right? And you're like, guess what? No, it's not a film. It's a series, okay? And ultimately, this needs to be compelling, right? How does something become compelling? Well, there needs to be the hero's journey. And even if there are no heroes, who, who's suffering through this? Who's learning? Who's growing? Who is fooled? Who is mistaken? Who is taken advantage of? Those are all the things you need to consider, right? And ultimately, as a filmmaker, your goal should be when it's month number 10 and I'm so burnt out or I'm stuck in my tent and it's freezing outside, what's the project that's going to make me willing to get out of that place and go shoot? What's the thing that's going to make me be willing to push record? That's what I want you to think about. And ultimately, I think that is the perfect recipe for making an excellent documentary. And what I would say is start small. All of my greatest projects, I think, have in many ways started with a small, simple idea. And some of those films have been two to three minutes and some of them have been an hour or more. And I would say that the, the smaller you can start and the closer you can start working with great creatives, the better. Collaboration is the key to any successful documentary, right? Working with a DP, a producer, a um, uh, assistant photographer, uh, AC, 
yada, 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 that will help you get the job done, right? You need people you can trust, people you can work with in close quarters because as many of you know, making documentaries usually aren't funded well, right? You're out there, you might be kind of working out of a sprinter van, camping, whatnot, but it doesn't mean the quality of the film or the footage can suffer. So I would, I would look forward to building that team, building that team that can help you bring this vision to life and really starting to understand what that vision is and how you are going to make it happen. Folks, thank you guys so much for joining me on this documentary filmmaking short course. Uh, there's so much more I want to go into and dive into and I wish we were in person so I could answer all those questions. Um, but either way, I know that this will give you some tips and tricks for how you can get started. Thanks you guys for joining Sony Kando online. Um, we're here in my gallery right now in Pismo Beach and um, I hope to see you all in person and join me for my other course at Sony Kando. Cheers.